<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so spring is near. Spring is near. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, you know, so I work for Conserve Wildlife Foundation of New Jersey. We're a small nonprofit organization where we're dedicated to you know monitoring, managing, and protecting New Jersey's endangered and threatened species. Uh, terrapins are are neither of uh, neither of those, uh, but they are uh, listed as special concern in New Jersey, and they're non-game species. Uh, so uh, so that's where you know uh, I started working with terrapins uh, from just chance encounters with them uh, from going out and doing other aspects of my job where I work to monitor and manage ospreys in coastal New Jersey. So, uh, so with that said, you know, that's where I had to drive down coastal, uh, you know, salt marsh access roads to get to boat ramps. And this is where I would encounter terrapins, of course, uh, because my surveys for ospreys happen in the middle of the summer. And this is also when terrapins are nesting. So, uh, this email specifically was one who kind of, uh, you know, sprang me into action to do something specifically to address uh, the roadkill issue uh, on one particular road, which is Great Bay Boulevard. And, uh, you know, that's where I found this female. She, I could tell she was, uh, you know, injured. You could see even right here, uh, you know, the fracture to her uh, upper and lower mandible. Uh, but I knew that, you know, when I found her, there was something I could do to help. So I took her to get rehabilitated. Uh, and she was uh, rehabilitated at Stockton University, and I later released her in September, uh, and this is back in 2009. And I pretty much, you know, said, hey, you know, we have to be doing something to try and protect these turtles on this road. So, you know, that's where the, the you know, Great Bay Terrapin Project was formed uh, and founded. And, uh, you know, that's where, you know, we work every year uh, to try and, you know, prevent road kills of adult females uh, on the road. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a project that's a lot of fun uh, and it's also very rewarding. And sometimes it's also very sad, uh, you know, when we see these individuals being hit by a car. But, uh, but overall, you know, it, it's been a lot of fun over the years to work with them. And, uh, you know, I've learned a lot in the field as well. So today I'm pretty much just gonna talk about everything Terrapin, uh, you know, so I'm gonna talk about a little bit about their life history about our project and, you know, also to talk about some of the newer work that we're doing on Great Bay Boulevard, uh, which happens to be, uh, you know, enhancing their habitat uh, because we know that they, you know, they, they need uh, suitable nest sites uh, to be able to reproduce. So uh, this is one of the things that we're gonna continue to do uh, in different areas throughout the coast uh, when we can find habitat that's suitable to enhance. So if any of you live in the Tuckerton or Little Lake Harbor, you know, more than likely you've seen terrapins, plenty of terrapins. Uh, they're pretty numerous in the area uh, and, uh, and that's because they inhabit our salt marshes. But uh, terrapins are medium sized turtles. So uh, they're, you know, about, uh, you know, nine inches max, uh, you know, and males are smaller than females. So pretty much mostly you see the females if you see them on land, uh, except for when they're basking in a, in a creek. But they have a dark carapace, uh, as you can see with this individual here, uh, and they have uh, olive kind of uh, yellowish colors on their uh, the bridge of their shell, uh, which goes down to their plastron, which is their lower shell, uh, where you can see the dark, uh, you know, markings on there. And then their skin is also very, you know, uh, it varies very highly between individuals, uh, you know, but you get some really distinctive uh, coloration with, with certain individuals like this female here where they're very gray with uh, dark spots, uh, which are very beautiful. Uh, and you can see their mandible there as well is usually, is usually uh, light, uh, but in some cases it can be stained or is a darker color uh, as well. But they really vary uh, highly between individuals. So it's really uh, interesting to see, you know, the differences between one individual to another. So their name, uh, you know, their, uh, their scientific name is Molechmes uh, terrapin. Uh, their, you know, name is derived from them being a mollusk eating uh, turtle. Uh, and they're an edible turtle, of course. Uh, they're a very common food source from Native Americans in our area. So, uh, you know, and even uh, European settlers, you know, really, uh, you know, exploited terrapins, I think is a, is a correct way to say it uh, here once uh, you know, they uh, kind of dominated, uh, you know, our, our coastal area and, uh, you know, developed, uh, you know, the coastal area. So, 
they're a very common food source, uh, you know, up until the, the 1930s and 40s. But uh, terrapins range throughout New Jersey uh, in our salt marsh areas uh, from the Meadowlands south to Cape May uh, and then up along the Delaware Bay shore. And then they range, uh, you know, throughout the, the United States from about Cape Cod to uh, Cape Hatteras and then down, uh, you know, the, uh, along the, the Gulf Coast uh, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico as well. So in that picture uh, on the previous screen just showed the uh, difference in size between the male and female. And that's where the, the females are probably about twice the size of, a, of an adult male, uh, which, is, which is very unique. And uh, they can get to be uh, very large. So here you could just see this is their, you know, picturesque, uh, you know, salt marsh habitat uh, where these individuals have a very high level of site fidelity. Uh, there's some research that's been done on them where some individuals inhabit the same creek for their entire lives, which is really fascinating uh, to see. Uh, and, and some of this we can actually affirm with some of the data from uh, marking individuals on Great Bay Boulevard where you know, they're captured in one area and then they're recited in the same area three years later. Uh, so we see this on Great Bay Boulevard as well with our data. So terrapins, they're, uh, they're carnivores, so they eat other animals. Uh, primarily they eat mollusks, but they also eat uh, fiddler crabs, blue claw crabs, uh, worms and carrion and they, uh, they forage uh, in water. So they're searching for prey uh, in water. And uh, of course, females can eat larger prey. So that's where they can more likely uh, handle blue claw crabs more so than the males, where they might forage more on little fiddler crabs and uh, worms and such. Uh, but they forage mostly during uh, you know, high tide cycles uh, and low tide. Uh, if, you know, if you're ever boating at that time and go by, you know, creeks or something, uh, which is usually difficult because many are so shallow, but uh, if you ever do, then that's when most are, are usually up uh, basking along shorelines. And it's really cool to see uh, when, they're, when they're all up basking and on top of each other. So they're cold-blooded. So or ectothermic, which basically means they're, uh, you know, their activity is regulated by their environment. So they're only active when it's warm. So during this time of year, they're still hibernating right now. Uh, so that's usually when they're buried under a thin layer of mud uh, or in the banks of our creeks. And usually they don't become active until uh, mid to late April, uh, but it really depends on uh, the water temperatures uh, mostly, you know, uh, the majority of them are active in, in May uh, when water temperatures really warm up. Uh, you know, males reach sexual maturity around five to seven years old, females around 10 years old, and that's pretty much when they reach in a size uh, when they can actually reproduce, which is, uh, you know, larger for females. And, uh, you know, they could live a very long time. Uh, I think 40 years was the maximum uh, terrapins ever been seen to live. Uh, we just had one female uh, last year who we recited who's 26 years old. Uh, she was marked uh, as, a, as an adult in 2008 on Great Bay Boulevard by uh, researchers with Drexel University. And then we recaptured her uh, just last year, which is really awesome. We've never had an individual that old uh, recaptured on Great Bay Boulevard. So it's just amazing. She's avoided uh, being hit by car uh, over all these years. And really, there's a lot of things about terrapins where we don't really understand, you know, especially with how they brumate uh, and survive uh, the cold winter months, you know, uh, where they're not eating, uh, they're not breathing. Uh, so there's a lot of things we still need to learn about terrapins. And just a, several years ago, they learned that terrapins, uh, you know, brumate in, in large colonies. So that's where they're uh, together um, underwater and under mud in large pockets uh, of individuals. Uh, where they winter together and no one really even knows why they do that as well. So threat to terrapins, uh, there's lots of threats to terrapins. You know, one of the biggest ones I think, uh, you know, is coastal development uh, where, you know, when we build on our salt marshes, uh, which this happened mostly in the 1950s and 60s, where we build lagoons and housing developments and bulkhead areas, it basically restricts their uh, natural movement and, you know, uh, causes them to, to lose their habitat where they might have nested. 
uh, historically. And then to get to those developments, we put in roads. So those also bisect their habitat uh, where they're trying to reach you know, their nesting areas. So instead they have to cross these roads now uh, where then that's where they could be hit by car. Uh, fascinating thing last year that, uh, you know, I experienced was just hearing about, uh, you know, how terrapins still try to climb up over bulkheads to nest in people's yards uh, in Little Lake Harbor in Mystic Island. I had some people uh, where they had terrapins coming up in their backyards, and if they had like a little dock or ramp that went up, uh, the terrapins would climb up the ramp and still lay eggs uh, in their backyard, uh, which I thought was, was totally amazing. I didn't even think that they could even do that, but they do. Uh, so if anyone lives on a lagoon and you want to have terrapins nest in your yard, I guess you could put in a ramp for them. <laughs> uh, but uh, ghost crab pots uh, are a, a really big threat to them uh, that are pretty uh, unknown as far as how bad it is because, uh, you know, they're something you can't see. So you don't really know how many terrapins get trapped in these ghost pots and unfortunately die in them. Uh, you only know when they're recovered and you find all the, the remains of terrapins in there. Uh, or they're, they wash up on shore or, you know, somebody finds them. Uh, so, uh, you know, so a lot of uh, terrapins potentially die in these traps, but there's been efforts to remove more of these ghost pots uh, just to try and prevent this uh, self-perpetuating trap. And uh, lastly, uh, predation is a pretty big issue, uh, you know, just because some of the main predators for terrapins, you know, are predators that weren't really as numerous, uh, you know, historically for them, like raccoons, uh, even red foxes who are not native uh, to New Jersey, uh, where they predate a lot of nests. So I think around one to 3% of uh, eggs that are laid survive to be an adult. Uh, so that's a pretty low uh, survival rate, but uh, we're, we're seeing, uh, you know, terrapins do pretty well uh, in the grape area. So, uh, you know, we're hoping to see their numbers uh, improve even more with some more habitat enhancement work. So our main project area is Great Bay Boulevard Wildlife Management Area. Uh, it's one of the largest wildlife management areas in New Jersey. It's, uh, you know, 5,500 acres uh, of salt marsh habitat uh, and pretty much excellent habitat for Great Bay uh, terrapins and Barnegat Bay terrapins to come up and nest. Uh, it's a really unique area because it's also home to the uh, Jacques Cousteau uh, National Estuarian Research Reserve, which is, uh, provides it another level of protection uh, and uh, research uh, in this area. And, uh, you know, it's just a really fascinating site how, uh, you know, there's a road that goes out to the end of this uh, peninsula where, you know, there's pretty much uh, not much out there uh, besides, you know, the salt marsh habitat. And, uh, you know, uh, so the road was built to basically access, uh, you know, a Coast Guard base that was at the end and the old fish factory, which is out there and, uh, you know, pretty much bisected that habitat. But uh, at the same time, the creation of the road also, uh, you know, enhanced habitat for terrapins. You know, before the road was created, there probably wasn't many or there weren't many, you know, nesting opportunities for terrapins along the road. But when we created the road, we brought in fill, which essentially enhanced habitat for terrapins. So I have no uh, doubt that, you know, terrapins uh, have definitely benefited from the road, besides some being hit by car, uh, you know, every year. So, uh, you know, here you could just see the road uh, and it's bisected, uh, you know, bis bisecting the habitat there. Uh, you know, and, and this is where you can see our uh, habitat enhancement site at a former marina uh, right in the foreground there. If you've ever driven down Great Bay Boulevard in the summer, especially in June during a full or new moon, then you've probably uh, seen plenty of terrapins. Uh, usually during this time of year uh, on one of these days, uh, there's more terrapins than cars on the road, uh, which is uh, quite the quite the scene to uh, you know to witness. Terrapins pretty much nest everywhere along the road, uh, but mainly they nest in areas where there's more fill or elevation, uh, where their nests are protected from potential flooding, uh, like the abutments for the bridges. Uh, terrapins absolutely love nesting in these areas, uh, and this is also where they can get into a lot of trouble because they actually do cross the bridges as well. 
and they nest in very close proximity to the road. Like you can see this individual right here who is nesting right on the edge of the road, uh, right by one of the bridges, which is not a great place to nest. But they're going to make use of what they can because there aren't many great places to nest on Great Bay Boulevard. So here's just another individual uh, crossing right here, again, by one of the bridges. Uh, this is by the first bridge. And then this is uh, before the first bridge uh, in one of the little pull-offs. Uh, that's another little, you know, uh, uh, upland area. And these are just the areas where they seek out whether the habitat is, uh, you know, degraded or not. Like this is very tough soil, very hard to dig in, uh, but they'll nest uh, anywhere where they can, where it's above the high tide line uh, and in these gravelly, sandy areas, uh, which is areas that they seek out to nest. So one of the things that we did with our project was, uh, you know, basically, you know, install signs, uh, you know, to raise awareness for terrapins, because when we first started working with them, there were absolutely no signs or anything highlighting, you know, the fact that you would encounter possibly 100 terrapins uh, while driving down this road on a given day in, in the summer. So this was just one of the first steps that we, we had when, uh, you know, starting this project for them. So our project mm -hmm. began in 2010. Oh, yep. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to interrupt, but we do have two no. questions in the chat if you don't mind taking a look. Yeah. Um, one was just to get a better clarification on the size of a juvenile versus size of an adult male and adult female. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. Um, so yeah. is there, you know, carapace length or um, so how yep. would you distinguish the three? Yeah, so uh, so hatchlings, you know, whether th after they emerge in the fall or in the spring, because some overwinter in nests, uh, you know, as hatchlings, they're about the size of a, a half dollar. Uh, so uh, there is one picture I can go back to, uh, which you can see here. So that's uh, that's like a that's not even a hatchling. That's like a, a two year old terrapin that I found one day compared to an adult female. Uh, so I just happened to find both that day and, and put one on top of each other just to show the comparison, you know, side by side where you could see the dist the difference in sizes. But, uh, you know, overall, the males are probably about this big. They're very small, uh, you know, and you can see here where that's where I say they're about three inches uh, in length. And that's the length of their carapace where the females can be up to nine inches in length. And it really depends on their age. You know, the, the, the older they are, the bigger they are. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and the more worn they, they get as well too with their, their carapace. Does that help? Okay, great. Yeah, I think, I think so. And then um, the next question is that someone read that it appears to be more male hatchlings lately versus female, maybe based on changing weather patterns. Uh, does this mean that reproduction cycle is being impacted? Uh, yeah, I guess that really depends on uh, the geographic region, uh, you know, and the specific site where they're nesting, um, you know, and the depth of of the eggs and the nests, uh, yeah. I mean, the sex of the young is is dependent on the the temperature of the nest. So, uh, so usually warmer temperatures, though, you usually produce more females. So, I think some studies, uh, you know, at least with turtles in general, have kind of pointed to, you know, possible uh, sex specific ratios uh, shifting more towards uh, females just because uh, of climate change uh, and. Mm -hmm you know, uh, you know, having warmer temperatures, uh, you know, throughout summer months, especially when eggs are being incubated. Uh, I'm not sure. I know Dr. Wenick has, has done some work with, uh, you know, looking at temperatures in nests at sedge. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what he's found, uh, but, uh, you know, we don't really, we don't age them, uh, you know, after the hatchlings hatch, uh, or sorry, we don't sex them. Uh, so we don't really know. I mean, it's something we could possibly do, uh, but I know that overall, I, I believe that there's been more, you know, uh, more efforts to possibly even look at, you know, when a lot of times when uh, eggs are artificially incubated by like Wetlands Institute or other organizations, they specifically 
shoot for more females. So they incubated a warmer temperature. But I think in some cases now they've been kind of saying to do a mixture of both males and females because, mm -hmm. you know, with climate change, there's potentially going to be more females than males. And if you're just putting more females out there who were head started, then, you know, it's possible that, you know, there's going to be less males to potentially mate with those females. That's really interesting. Um, and then one more before I'll let you yep. continue. Um, uh, they see them crossing the road all the time um, and uh, the hatchlings. So should we help them cross the road, how to pick them up? Um, don't want them to get run over. Um, so yeah. they just want to better understand how to handle them. Uh, I think the hatchlings uh, specifically when they see them. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, like I, I mentioned before, I mean, hatchlings overwintering nests, uh, usually that happens more so when the eggs were laid later in the season and they didn't have time to hatch before, you know, the onset of colder temperatures in the fall. Uh, so usually, you know, they don't, uh, you know, they don't emerge until April or some might even start emerging now or when we get 70 degree days uh, like we just had, depending on the soil temperatures, uh, some might emerge. And if you would find them, then the best thing to do, uh, you know, if you are concerned about them, you can, uh, we can get them to uh, mates uh, it, or Project Terrapin in Matahawken, where they can be kept uh, indoors until they can be released. Or you can just release them in an area where you found them, uh, you know, in vegetation, vegetation close to water. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's brackish water. So you don't want to move them long distances. Yeah, some people might think, oh, a baby turtle, I'm going to take it home and, and keep it, uh, you know, and then five, 10 years down the road, then it's going to be this big giant turtle, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, releasing, it's not going to be good, you know, so. Gotcha. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, no yep. other questions for right now. I'll let you continue. Yeah. And to handle them, uh, you know, to, I mean, these turtles are, are pretty rugged, uh, you know, they're, they're hard shelled, of course, you know, but, uh, you know, I think it, you do have to kind of be careful with hatchlings because their shells can be a little soft uh, when they're young. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you would collect one that's, you know, uh, you're worried about or you want to transport somewhere to like mates uh, or just to release it, you could put it in a little Tupperware container uh, with a little bit of uh, brackish water, uh, maybe a couple pieces of seaweed in there or something. Uh, an adult, you know, if you ever find one of them that's injured or something, uh, you know, it's best to hold them from the, the sides of their, their shell, uh, where the bridge is between their two legs, or from their, their uh, you know, front and hind legs. And, uh, you know, bucket works to, to keep them in just because they are great climbers. Uh, so like a five gallon bucket is definitely the best thing uh, to hold them and, uh, you know, or a, a container that has a lid uh, as well will work. All right, so continuing on with our project. So yeah, after I found that adult female that was hit by a car, you know, I thought of all these things that we needed to do. Uh, you know, first one, like I just uh, mentioned before, was installing signs. So that's where we had signs placed on the road to basically raise awareness just for drivers driving down the road. Uh, I knew that other organizations throughout New Jersey and in other areas had installed barrier fencing to potentially prevent them from getting into the road. Uh, so we installed some barrier fencing along the first portion of Great Bay Boulevard, more so as a place just to test it, uh, because uh, you know Great Bay Boulevard, uh, there's there's been research performed in the past that I used as uh, references to kind of look at where terrapins were coming up, where the highest mortality rates were, on what sections of road, and installed the fencing just to try and reduce the mortality in those areas where the highest mortality rates were. And that's pretty much the first section of road when you go out and uh, the fencing has worked great. Uh, it's helped keep them off the road, but I have to say it's been uh, like a thorn in my side, uh, very hard to maintain uh, because, you know, it gets vandalized year after year and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot of time and effort to uh, maintain where otherwise, uh, you know, another aspect of the project is where we recruit volunteers to go out and do surveys on the road or patrol. Uh, and also help maintain the fence. And, uh, you know, also I think engaging 
uh, local residents and, and visitors is even, you know, more rewarding because they're, you know, getting to, to help these species, uh, you know, uh, complete their life cycle and also, uh, you know, encourage others to do the same as well. And lastly, uh, you know, one of the other things that we really did in the beginning and, and kind of do a little bit now was really look at many different roads throughout New Jersey where there were roadkill hotspots and worked with uh, road departments, county engineering uh, or state uh, DOT to install, you know, crossing signs for them uh, or barriers like this uh, that we use on Great Bay Boulevard on other roads, like, you know, even on uh, Route 72 for the Causeway uh, Bridge Project on Bonnet Island where fencing was installed and they have signs there as well on Route 30 down in Atlanta County and uh, even the uh, Garden State Parkway as well, uh, just to really try and help uh, prevent uh, road kills from some of these major highways as well. So this year, uh, this was another new sign uh, that we installed on Great Bay Boulevard. And this is a sign that was uh, originally used by the Wetlands Institute down in Stone Harbor, uh, on Stone Harbor Boulevard. And we thought that something like this would work really well on Great Bay Boulevard, just because it's something that we can change uh, during the season to kind of indicate the, uh, the volume uh, or you know, presence of terrapins on the road. So this is where we can change the text beneath crossing alert just to say, uh, you know, low, moderate, or high. Uh, you know, so drivers really know to pay really close attention or, uh, you know, maybe not worry about it uh, as much as well. So every year we uh, recruit volunteers, like I mentioned, but we also uh, recruit student interns. Uh, and this is where they conduct surveys on the road. Uh, they you know, collect data on terrapins that they encounter. Uh, that includes just uh, environmental conditions, uh, the GPS coordinates, uh, and uh, information about the uh, animal. So that's where they uh, they collect that animal, and then they they measure them uh, and they assess their health. So that's where they also look at their carapace and plastron, and uh, you know, to try and determine their age, and uh, and if. Uh, if they're not marked, uh, then they're marked. Uh, and you can see this individual right here uh, where the, the width of their uh, carapace is being measured uh, and uh, with some big calipers right there. Uh, and uh, one of my interns here, Joe, uh, from last year is uh, notching uh, the marginal scoots of this individual. And that's just a way to identify uh, a terrapin, kind of like uh, giving them a tattoo, but instead you're just uh, notching their their shells uh, with an alpha code uh, where we're able to, uh, you know, uh, identify them in the future. So uh, last year, uh, we uh, began a project where we uh, enhanced habitat for terrapins. Uh, and this was done at a former marina. And this was basically, uh, you know, chosen as a site just because of its uh, easy access uh, off of the road. Uh, but close to their, uh, you know, their habitat, uh, you know, the coastal ditches and creeks and uh, back bay areas surrounding uh, Great Bay Boulevard. Uh, so the marina was Rand's boats. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it sustained pretty bad damage uh, from Superstorm Sandy and uh, you know, eventually the owner, uh, you know, sold his property to the state of New Jersey uh, through the Green Acres program. And, uh, and that's where, uh, you know, it, it uh, was joined with uh, Crepe Boulevard Wildlife Management Area. Uh, and uh, so here you can just see the remnants of it, uh, you know, after uh, Sandy, uh, where the marina pretty much was, uh, you know, taken away uh, after the fact. And then here it is uh, a couple of years ago. And basically the site is, is just a gravel parking area uh, off the road. And it's one that was flooded very frequently uh, from coastal flooding. Uh, where, you know, it didn't really provide great habitat for terrapins to nest. So that's where, uh, you know, it was easily identified as a site that, uh, you know, we can use to create nesting habitat for terrapins. And, uh, you know, so here you could just see the, you know, the puddles that, uh, you know, were in the parking area. So 
Uh, you know, not even a great place to drive if you did want to park there because you would still just be driving through salt water. Uh, so just a, a great place to uh, have a pilot project like this for Terrapins. So that's where we partnered with the state of New Jersey with the Division of Fish and Wildlife to enhance this site uh, since it is state land. Uh, they were a partner on the project and helped obtain the permits to be able to do this work. And we received funding through uh, the DEP uh, Supplemental Environmental uh, Program, uh, which is basically uh, you know, a program through DEP with compliance and enforcement where someone who is a polluter, uh, pay, instead of paying a fine, uh, they can fund uh, a Supplemental Environmental Project, which is proposed through that program. And we proposed this project and received funding uh, from Forked River Power for this. And uh, you know they were more than happy to uh, to see this project uh, you know be uh, be completed. So to complete the project, uh, you know uh, you know pretty much one of the things that terrapins need is uh, sandy areas above the high tide line. So how we created this site uh, was to uh, first install. Uh, fencing just to kind of delineate the perimeter of the site and keep vehicles out. And then we installed uh, core logs, which are uh, coconut fiber log. And this was something just to help prevent the sand from eroding in situations like this, uh, which you can see this was uh, while the project uh, was uh, underway and sand was being delivered to site to the site. You could see there was a little uh, flooding event here, uh, which flooded the entire parking lot and uh, the area where the sand was being, uh, you know, uh, spread out. So, and this is just how you can see the, an aerial shot of the core logs and how they were used. So we used a, a little diamond uh, or triangular pattern just to kind of give some elevation to uh, the, you know, to the site and, uh, you know, help keep as much sand as possible in there uh, so that it wouldn't wash away in, in uh, you know, flood events. So uh, the sand that we used was, uh, you know, no real special blend, uh, but, you know, terrapins do love, uh, you know, your white beach sand uh, or the sand that you see on your dunes, say, at like Island Beach State Park. Uh, you know, so it has to have both coarse, uh, you know, granules and fine granules with a little bit of, uh, you know, organic material uh, in there as well. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we had placed on site. Uh, we placed approximately 3,000 tons of sand uh, on site to fill in about a half acre uh, with this sand. So in here you could just see, uh, you know, the sand, uh, what it looked like after it got placed, uh, you know, in the core logs. Uh, where, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, spread with a, an excavator or a backhoe uh, inside the area. And, uh, and then wrapped up with some fence. So one of the, one of the things after we, uh, you know, monitored the site over several months, uh, well, I should just go back, uh, you know, really one of the things we weren't sure of after placing the sand on site was whether we'd have to uh, manually spread it out to go over the core logs because we, you know, there would be no way for terrapins to get up onto the sand without it covering the core logs. Uh, and we were possibly going to do that manually or by running another small machine like a bobcat potentially to uh, push the sand over them. But instead, uh, which is which is probably good, uh, while I was in Hawaii, uh, you know, uh, the weather and, and rain and wind, uh, you know, helped push the sand over the core log so we didn't have to do anything. We just let the mother nature uh, do its thing and the sand uh, spread out over the core logs. And then after that happened in, in late March and early April, we uh, planted uh, hundreds of uh, native plants, uh, you know, throughout the site. So we used some shrubs like beach plum and uh, bayberry and Grenzel's bush and planted a lot of uh, dune grass. Uh, I don't even know how many, uh, you know, plants uh, I actually put in, but definitely over 500. Uh, and uh, I was very fortunate to have my kids to be able to help me because at the same time of doing all this, uh, you know, it was during a, a global pandemic. So it made things a little bit more interesting and challenging, but also fun, fun activities. Keep my kids involved. 
So after uh, you know planting the plants, you know we continue to monitor the site, uh, you know, and wait to see when terrapins will start nesting. Uh, nesting didn't occur on the site until uh, the second week of June, uh, and that's when we started to document terrapins nesting throughout the site, uh, which uh, you know they uh, utilized many different portions of. Uh, so here you could just see a photo of a couple individuals with our plants, uh, you know where they basically, they would come up and look for a nest site uh, that was suitable for them and then start digging. Uh, well, here it didn't really take them that long uh, because the whole site was pretty suitable for them. Uh, and they were utilizing all different uh, parts of the, the site to nest. So when they would actually nest, uh, we would protect the nests if they were found with uh, a predator exclosure or a, a cage. Uh, and this is just a simple galvanized metal cage that was staked down. And in some cases we would uh, use a, a rock or uh, another heavier object just to put over top to try and prevent predators from uh, getting those eggs. And then the nest was labeled uh, as well. So also there when monitoring the site for nesting, you know, in some individuals we would find crossing, we would obviously help them cross as well and possibly even put them in our, our turtle garden as well, just to give them a, a helping hand. And, uh, you know, I think one of the challenging things for us this year uh, was definitely, you know, having enough volunteers uh, or uh, time at the site to actually monitor for nesting because, uh, you know, this is just, it's very hard to find nests if you're not there very frequently to be able to identify them because terrapins do a really good job of covering up their nests. And this is just where you could see this individual on the left there is right over its nest. So you can see how well it did of camouflaging its nest. Uh, and then the right side is a nest that was left, uh, which we, we found as well. So when nests were found uh, like these and like on the left there, you could see another imprint uh, from uh, an individual. And it was definitely much easier after a fresh rainfall. Uh, or when we had some wind where it would, you know, really clean up the site and not look like, uh, you know, much was disturbed, you would easily find tracks uh, and then, you know, be able to locate the, the terrapin nest. And after we find nests, uh, we would exclose them. So that's where we would dig the nest to count the number of eggs and then put a exclosure over them. And uh, that's my daughter who was happy to help me out, uh, you know, with this last year and also my son. Uh, so we monitored the site throughout the, the summer months, you know, into uh, September and, uh, and even into October. And that's where we looked for hatching at the nests. And, you know, one of the things with the predator exclosures that, uh, you know, we found this year is that, um, you know, the terrapins are able to leave the exclosures on their own uh, and, uh, you know, uh, entered their habitat without any kind of um, you know, human intervention, which is exactly what we wanted. You know, we didn't want to have them uh, leave their nest and then get stuck uh, inside the exclosure uh, so that they could bake in the sun so they can leave on their own and, uh, you know, grow right into their own habitat, which is just uh, exactly what we wanted. And some individuals who hatched later in the season uh, at the site uh, we collected them. Uh, this was in October, uh, usually when hatchlings don't do as well or when they would actually overwinter in the nest as hatchlings. Uh, we collected them and they're currently at uh, Little Lake Harbor School Districts, uh, two, uh, two schools, both, uh, you know, George Mitchell and Frog Pond, where they're being head started by students and uh, teachers there. And I think there was 17 uh, hatchlings that we collected and uh, gave to them to uh, to head start. Uh, so, uh, and this is where they'll, they'll basically, uh, you know, like triple in size. So they'll be, you know, so their chances of surviving will be much greater than, uh, you know, when they were these tiny little hatchlings uh, where they would be a, a, a really tasty morsel for a gull. Sorry, I just have my pandemic hat here. <laughs> Looking for attention. So in 2020, uh, we encountered uh, a little over a thousand terrapins uh, throughout our project area. Uh, most of those were on Great Bay Boulevard. Uh, we uh, documented a little over 80 road kills, but many of those, I believe, 
where uh, duplicate uh, observations where some of my volunteers were observing the same individuals who were hit by car. Uh, so that just means that next or this year, we're going to do a better job of making sure that doesn't happen uh, to get a more accurate, uh, you know, count of, of road kills. Because overall, I mean, the road kill rate we've managed to keep at around like four to five percent, which is half of what was observed before we began the project. Last year, it was around 10 percent. Uh, so, uh, you know, so either we're not doing a very good job. Uh, we're letting a lot of terrapins get hit by a car, or we're just counting those individuals over and over again. I definitely believe we're counting uh, the road killed individuals over and over again. A total of 170 individuals uh, were marked uh, by our interns, uh, where 20 of those were recaptures, uh, which means that we encountered them in the past. Uh, like I mentioned before, yeah, the one individual was 26 years old, which was uh, totally amazing. Uh, Last year was the first year where we uh, partnered with the Division of Fish and Wildlife and Project Terrapin to conduct an assessment of wild terrapins. Uh, you know, and so this meant, uh, you know, we collected, uh, this is where we collected 30 terrapins on one day, where then the next day we collected uh, samples from them, including, uh, you know, uh, swabs uh, and blood uh, to basically look for viruses uh, or any kind of uh, pathogens that they might carry, which could affect, you know, the wild populations. And basically, you know, uh, this was done so that we can kind of guide, uh, you know, the future release of captive terrapins, because every year, uh, you know, we, we find individuals who have basically been, uh, you know, either taken from the wild as pets, uh, and then, you know, once they're taken, you know, or, and, uh, you know, or somebody gets them, you know, they, they need to be released. Uh, so we need to really, you know, try and form some guidelines for this, and no one's really done this. So this is where this assessment of wild terrapins really help guide the future release of, of terrapins who've been in captivity and potentially with many different other turtles uh, and other terrapins where they could possibly spread diseases into wild terrapins is this is just what we want to prevent from happening. So that's why this uh, assessment of their health is really crucial uh, in that regard. Uh, at our turtle garden, we had uh, over 50 nests. Uh, it got to the point where there were so many nests uh, that we ran out of cages that we had made. Uh, and, uh, you know, we weren't able to get more material to make cages just because of a, a, a shortage uh, from uh, the, you know, the pandemic. So that made things a little bit interesting. But in some cases, you know, I'm happy to, you know, to see that at least 50 nests got protected there more so than many other nests that are outside the area where the most of them are predated. Uh, you know, even if some nests got predated at our, at our turtle garden, uh, you know, 50 of them were still protected. So it allowed us to be able to ensure their survival more so than, uh, you know, many other nests that aren't, you know, uh, afforded that protection, like at our turtle garden. And pretty much every single uh, nest that was protected hatched young. So when we went back and removed the exclosures, uh, later on, after there were signs that they hatched, there were no nests that had any, uh, you know, none of our protected nests, uh, you know, had failed or not hatched young or were predated at all. And, uh, you know, our turtle garden was really key in helping to relocate nests too, because there were many nests that uh, we moved from people's backyards where they were not in great areas or uh, and other dangerous parts of Great Bay Boulevard that we relocated to our turtle garden where they could be protected. And also there were eggs from roadkill adults from other areas that we uh, placed in the turtle garden as well. And they, for the, for the majority, they all hatched young as well too, which was really great. Another huge benefit of, uh, of the turtle garden. So here you can just see, I, I wish, uh, you know, I mean, I guess I could open up Google Earth and show you this, but uh, you could just see this is, uh, this is just a map showing all of our sightings uh, on Great Bay Boulevard from last year. 
Uh, so pretty much, uh, you know, terrapins are found all throughout the road, uh, you know, up and down its entire length of five miles. And, uh, you know, so they're very numerous along the road. And uh, here's just a, uh, this is actually a, a video. I don't even know if I can get it to play from my drone showing, uh, showing the site and uh, what it looks like now. Sorry, I had to get my cat out of here. He kept me out. <laughs> my darn pandemic kitten. All right. So yeah, over uh, over the past uh, decade, uh, we've encountered over seven thousand terrapins on the road. You know, we've increased awareness for terrapins by installing uh, you know crossing signs for them all along the road and other areas. We've managed to reduce the roadkill rate to about half of what it was historically. Uh, we've engaged, uh, you know, dozens of volunteers uh, in their conservation uh, by, uh, you know, having them help out with the project and recording data for us. Uh, and we've also worked with, uh, you know, many different government agencies, both local and state and county, uh, you know, to be able to address these uh, roadkill issues uh, throughout, you know, the state of New Jersey, especially in Little Lake Harbor and, and Tuckerton. And, uh, you know, now we're enhancing habitat for terrapins just to be able to provide them more suitable nest sites, uh, you know, in areas where primarily the habitat is, is pretty degraded uh, or it's at jeopardy of uh, becoming lost just from, uh, you know, climate change and, and sea level rise as well. So we're going to continue to, you know, really look for other areas throughout New Jersey, especially in Barnegat Bay and Great Bay to enhance more habitat for terrapins because it's really a uh, an easy thing to do when you can find uh, an area that's easily accessible by a salt marsh access road uh, and it's not going to impact habitat for other species. So with that, uh, you know, happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. We'll uh, right now give you a remote round of applause. <laughs> that was great. Um, and love the pandemic pet, the pandemic pets. Um, yeah, he, my wife like closed the door of my office because like my kids are eating lunch right now, and he and then he got trapped in here, so he's oh, no. yelling at the door <laughs> to get out. <laughs> no worries at all. Um, so I'm gonna scroll up our uh, our chat here. Um, I know I touched on this a little bit, but the first question is to discuss the protection provided uh, protection provided to the nests at Rands Marina. How do you monitor the hatching success of the terrapin garden? Yeah, so when we find a nest, I mean, that's in many cases, I found that that was, you know, one of the hardest things to do because I, I mean, I would love it if I would have somebody there 24 seven, mm -hmm. but that was just not something we could do. Uh, and, you know, last year, you know, I think it was even harder just because of doing this during COVID-19, uh, you know, but, so what we try to do is visit, you know, every day and you'd walk around the site, look to see if there's any evidence of any nesting. If you didn't see any evidence, then, you know, nothing was done. If evidence was, um, if you could see evidence of a nest, which was a depression, you know, where it looked like uh, an individual had nest, we would dig down and see if there's any eggs. And if there was, we would install uh, a cage uh, over the nest and you know, in many cases, if it, if it wasn't me and one of my volunteers, they simply just put the cage over it and put a rock on it. And then I would come back and dig it up and count how many eggs. Uh, and then we would know for certain, uh, you know, how many were there, if any were lost or didn't hatch or whatever, uh, to determine their, you know, hatch rate and everything. Uh, and then, you know, when we went back in the fall or, you know, September, to look for, you know, the hatch rates and everything, uh, you know, basically, yeah, I kept telling my volunteers since we've never done this, I was like, okay, I really, you know, we didn't really know exactly what to look for, but once we started seeing hatching, uh, it was really easy, you know, uh, when, when the young pretty much left the nest, we just saw like a little hole. So there was a hole left uh, inside the cage 
And uh, in some cases, you know, if, if it was right after hatching, you would see the little tracks uh, going all over like a spider web from the, the terrapins leaving the cage. But in other cases, you might just see a, a hole in the middle there. And that's where they, they basically climbed out of their nest cavity and dispersed on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we pretty much then at that point removed the cage and then, you know, counted that as a successful uh, nest. Gotcha. All these little clues that help you oh, yeah. figure it yeah. out. Yeah. That they're doing terrapin forensics, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so question about the plastic barriers along the road. How does it work? Uh, if the hatchling is crossing the road, can they get over it? Or is it to keep the adult turtles from crossing the road and finding a place to nest, especially to stay away from uh, the bridges? Yep. Right. So the so the barriers that we put up are right uh, after the first bridge or culvert. I don't know. Well, actually, it's before the first bridge or after the first culvert after Seaview Ave or Seaview Drive. Uh, and uh, basically, that was this section of road where the highest mortality rates were found in a previous study uh, on Great Bay Boulevard. And, you know, I think one of the things uh, it's really been the most challenging with that is, I mean, originally I was like, hey, let's fence the whole road. Let's do it. We could raise the money, put it up. And I'm so glad we didn't do that because the <laughs> hardest part with this is maintaining the fence. I mean, you know, it's designed to keep the adults off the road. I mean, we primarily want to protect them over hatchlings uh, because they're the breeding adults and they take a very long time to reach sexual maturity. So we want to try and ensure that they survive to keep reproducing. Uh, the hatchlings, yeah, it's, it's definitely tougher for them. Uh, but usually if we would, you know, if the fence would be a functioning component and, and be solid and, and work right, we wouldn't have any hatchlings on the road, especially in the area where it's fenced because they wouldn't be able to get into the road. Uh, you know, so that shouldn't really be a problem. The fence is all, you know, great and in perfect condition, but our fence has been damaged by you know, cars hitting it, it's been mowed over by lawnmowers, uh, you know, people cut it just to step over it, people have removed mm -hmm. sections of it just to take, I guess. Uh, so, um, you know, it's definitely been challenging. And, uh, you know, I think either way, I mean, moving forward, we're going to eventually going to remove the fence, uh, it's going to come down, uh, just because it takes a lot of time for me to go out and mow and we'd whack along the edges of it. Uh, we don't just spray pesticides uh, or herbicides uh, to keep vegetation growth down. Uh, and it, it served well over the years, but I, you know, I, I really think that we could be just as successful by really, you know, raising awareness to the public or, or motorists and, um, you know, also possibly looking more at like the, the speed uh, on the road uh, mm -hmm. and, and lowering the speed limit specifically on Great Bay Boulevard. Right, gotcha. A um, couple more. Uh, the size of what are the size of the road kills? Do you age and sex them? Yeah, good question. Yeah, we it's sometimes depending on how bad the road kills are, uh, we can't really do much to them. Uh, you know, besides uh, you know document their uh, mortality, uh, but uh, most are going to be adult females. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, think. You know, early in the season, before we see nesting, we see more uh, hatchlings and possibly juveniles come up. At least this was the case last year when we were really, you know, trying to pinpoint when nesting was starting throughout New Jersey, uh, which wasn't until the second week in, in June. We saw more little guys uh, coming up on the road. But it's mostly the females who are the ones who are more numerous on the road and uh, are the ones who get hit by car. And primarily, you know, they're they're adults, so they're anywhere from six inches uh, to nine, and and possibly even a little bit bigger than that as well. Uh, so uh, you know, we don't really measure them. I mean, in some cases, it might be difficult because they're they get squished or you know their body gets uh, damaged, so we can't really take an accurate measurement. Uh, we do look to see if they they were notched previously or have a pit tag, uh, which is just like a um, it's an identification tag, uh, similar to like what pets get. Uh, so we could actually scan them and look to see if they were ever recaptured and just to try and identify that individual. Uh, so that's, and, and if anything else, we just look to see if there might be any eggs left that we can salvage mm -hmm. uh, that we would yeah. go and put in our turtle garden. Okay, just two more questions. I know um, we're just about at time. Um, so the first is, 
is there a preferred elevation for females choosing sites? Uh, I don't know if there's a, you know, a, a perfect elevation, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, it, it has to be above the high tide line. So, and, you know, even better if it doesn't get hit with flood tides, but, you know, I think that they can handle that as well because we see nests all up and down Great Bay Boulevard where uh, they can even be inundated and still survive. Uh, you know, and, and usually during the summer months, there isn't as many flood events as there is as there is outside of the, the nesting season as well. So, but I would say, uh, you know, above that high tide line is usually, you know, when they, you know, when they're seeking for nest sites, it happens during uh, a spring tide as well, too. So that's during a, a flood tide as well. So, you know, as long as it's above, you know, uh, that range, you know, during that time of year, then they should be fine. Gotcha. Um, and then finally, a uh, good question to end on. Um, will you be getting more plants for the garden? And are there more gardens currently in the works? Uh, yes, we will be planting more plants. Uh, so if anyone wants to help me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Keep getting some more. I'm getting some more dune grass to plant and I'm actually getting more shrubs as well and more goldenrod. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely plant, wanting to plant more there. Uh, last year was just an atrocious year for many things, but planting was terrible because we had uh, that tropical storm that hit too and we just had leaf burn on everything uh, as well. Uh, so I, I hope that all our shrubs, you know, come back, but uh, I'd love to see some flowering beach plum there in the future and, and more goldenrod. Uh, so we are going to be planting more. I already have plants ordered. Uh, so, uh, so we're going to definitely, uh, you know, have more of that. So. Great. Um, and then someone asked, how do you, how do we get in touch uh, with you if they want to help with planting? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, my contact info is on Conserve Wildlife Foundation's website, and that's uh, conservewildlifenj.org. OK. I'll so you can just go the on the chat. top menu bar. Yeah, or I can, if I can write in the chat, maybe if I stop yeah, sharing ahead. my screen. And also for everybody on the call, um, our registration links for the next uh, couple of programs are also in the chat, as well as my email. Um, but I'll let Ben also um, pop that information before we conclude yeah. today. Oh yeah, and the other answering the other part of that question too uh, with turtle gardens, uh, we are going to be looking for more areas to do this as well. It's just finding the right spot mm -hmm. and uh, you know getting some funding. I think with you know one of the things we really learned uh, you know is that terrapins will utilize almost any kind of sand uh, that you put in an area that's above the high tide line near the salt marsh. I mean, we were originally, there was a certain mixture of sand, which it was like, it's called uh, white mason sand. It's just, uh, you know, it looks like beach sand that you could buy from Clayton Masonry or any, you know, uh, distributor of like sand, uh, you know, or supplier of sand. And it was really expensive, but we went with a cheaper alternative uh, and it's worked out uh, quite well. So, you know, it was, uh, I think, uh, you know, a third of the cost of the white mason sand. So, so we're definitely gonna be looking to do this in more areas. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do from this was really kind of use this as a way to, you know, I think this project and something like this is something that could really be built into many different, um, you know, uh, resiliency projects mm -hmm. where we're doing living shoreline work. I think that a turtle garden component to any of these would dovetail easily with any project like that. So Absolutely. I'm really trying to, you know, really get this as something put into all these different projects throughout coastal New Jersey, because this, as you can see, even from our project, it really provides habitat in areas where they're in decline on our salt marshes. You know, our high marsh areas are being flooded more often. So we need to create more high marsh areas uh, that benefit terrapins, shorebirds, uh, beach nesting birds, uh, you know, many different species. Absolutely. Well, it's really great to see that so far it looks like it's working pretty well. And um, good luck also with this next season too. And uh, yeah. 
hopefully, like you said, you know, you get some more plants, get some more terrapins nesting there. Um, and also maybe some more volunteers to help you out. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ben. Um, uh, that was a great presentation. And um, again, I think you might have some people on this call interested in helping you out. So hopefully hey, you that's do. Fine. Shoot me an email. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ben, again, for that presentation. And thank you everybody for joining us today. That was great. Have a good day. Thank you, yep. Ben. Thanks. <laughs> Bye-bye. Take care.